Welcome to the National Archives and Records Administration's 2024 Genealogy Series. My name is Erin Townsend, and I am the coordinator for this year's program. We are so happy you've joined us. Every year, the National Archives hosts the Genealogy Series, a free educational genealogy event broadcast on YouTube. Our presenters are records experts from National Archives locations across the United States. The sessions offer family history research tools on federal records and are open to everyone, from beginners to experienced family historians. All are welcome. We invite you to join the conversation. During each session's premiere, you can participate with the presenters and other family historians via live chat. Ask questions and get the presenter's answers anytime throughout the video and for an additional 10 minutes after the presentation ends. Here's how to engage in the live chat. You can ask questions via chat by first logging into YouTube. Continue to watch chat because the speaker will answer your questions there. Type your questions at any time throughout the presentation. Please keep your questions on today's topic. We are offering five genealogy sessions on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, starting May 21st and ending June 25th. We will not have a session on June 11th. If you miss a premiere broadcast, please know that videos and handouts remain available online after the event, where you can view them at your convenience. Welcome to today's presentation titled World War II Enemy Alien Records related to Japanese Americans at the National Archives. We have three presenters joining us today, David Castillo, Ruth Chan, and Catherine Seitz. David joined the National Archives in 2015 and is a reference archives specialist at the National Archives at College Park. He specializes in records of federal law enforcement agencies, including the Department of Justice and FBI, and previously worked with military and intelligence agency records. Ruth is an archivist at the National Archives at San Francisco and a subject matter expert for Asian American and Pacific Islander related records. Ruth has a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of California, Davis, and a Master of Arts degree in public history from the University of South Carolina. She has worked at the National Archives since 2016. Catherine is an archive specialist with the Civil Reference Team at the National Archives in Washington, DC. Within the National Archives, she has worked on multiple initiatives designed to promote records of the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color experience. She is the co-founder of APA Unity, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Employee Affinity Group at the National Archives, and has been with the National Archives since 2016. Welcome, David, Ruth, and Catherine. Thank you for your presentation today. Welcome to our genealogy presentation on World War II and the alien records related to Japanese Americans. Today, my colleagues and I will share some stories from these often overlooked records, which are stored across several NAR offices, including those in Washington, DC, College Park, and San Francisco. We will also walk you through the process of searching for and requesting these files. All of this information will also be included in the provided handouts. But before we delve into the records, I want to first briefly go over the reasons behind the enemy alien control program and identify who would have fallen under this category. While the experiences of Japanese Americans incarcerated by the War Relocation Authority, or WRA, are more commonly known, many researchers may not be as familiar with the separate group investigated and detained as enemy aliens. Today, we want to shed some light on their stories and the unique records documenting their experiences. Hopefully, by covering these records, we can help fill in some of the missing pieces in your family's genealogy. So first, let's go over who would have been considered an enemy alien during World War II. In this wartime context, the term referred to anyone residing in the United States who wasn't a U.S. citizen and came from a country at war with America. This included individuals of Japanese, German, and Italian descent. 
The key factor was citizenship status. If you weren't an American citizen and claimed nationality from any one of these three Axis powers, you were classified an enemy alien. Presidential Proclamation 2525 provided the legal framework that authorized the federal government to specifically monitor and detain Japanese citizens who may be deemed potentially dangerous enemy aliens. There were two other proclamations that oversaw the investigations of German and Italian nationals. All three proclamations imposed the same restrictions, such as barring them from owning items deemed threatening, including firearms, radio sets, and cameras. Moreover, individuals could be removed from designated restricted zones and face limitations on their freedom of movement and property. Proclamation 2537 required all aliens of enemy nationalities to register and carry certificates of identification at all times. The registration process, which involved being fingerprinted and photographed, served as the foundation and list for the arrest that occurred immediately after, along with pre-war surveillance rosters, also known as ABC lists. These arrests disproportionately targeted Japanese nationals who were interned at a much higher rate than other Axis nationals. Now, did this mean every person who claimed nationality from an Axis power was investigated as an enemy alien? No, not at all. While thousands were arrested immediately after the proclamation was issued, these arrests usually targeted those who were heads of households, many times the father in the family, and those who had some connection with a Japanese-based organization, such as religious associations. You see a lot of clergymen who were interned. Or they may have been members or had contributed to pro-military groups or had a relationship with any organization that was perceived as furthering the causes of the government of Japan, whether they were benign or not. So just to reiterate, just because a person may have been considered an enemy alien under the new policy, they may not have been investigated as a potentially dangerous enemy alien who was brought in for interrogation and for many Japanese Americans interned and separated from their families. Were all enemy aliens who were arrested sent to permanent internment camps? No, but most who were arrested were also temporarily detained while waiting for the hearing and then later waiting for a determination to be made on their status. These temporary detentions could be at a local county prison or a converted warehouse or community center or former residential spaces like CCC camps. Officials even converted parts of immigration stations, such as Ellis Island and Angel Island, to temporarily hold these prisoners. After a hearing was completed, officials made recommendations on the next steps. If they determined that an intern individual was no longer deemed an immediate danger to the country, the person was then paroled to a WRA location. And I use the word paroled in quotations since it was used on many of the documents and in the government's eyes, the intern person was no longer considered a prisoner. But in reality, they were merely transferred from one prison camp to another. And again, at least for these Japanese Americans, going to a WRA camp meant reuniting with their families. Now for others who the government decided were dangerous, they were sent to separate permanent camps, specifically set up to house dangerous enemy aliens. In certain instances, particularly for Japanese nationals, they might have bypassed local temporary detentions and proceeded directly to a camp far from the restricted West Coast zone where they awaited their hearing. These camps were run by either immigration officials or the US Army, but just knowing who operated the camps only scratches the surface of the vast federal records available on World War II enemy aliens. What you see in front of you are all the federal agencies that were in charge of this program. As you can see, there were many agencies. It took an army, which literally included the US Army, to identify who was 
a potentially dangerous enemy alien, make these arrests, interrogate them, determine if they should be sent to a permanent internment camp, and finally operate these said camps. Today's presentation highlights the fact that there is no centralized repository for World War II enemy alien records. This point is underscored by the fact that three of us will be sharing stories from records housed in NARA offices located across the country. We will also briefly touch on additional records not covered today at the end of the presentation, including those from the State Department. Now I'm going to turn it over to David, who will cover the DOJ and military records held at College Park. Thank you, Ruth. So to begin with, I'll be discussing the records of the Department of Justice, which are held in Record Group 60 at the National Archives at College Park. The Department of Justice was responsible for the operation of the Enemy Alien Control Program through its Enemy Alien Control Unit. And so they maintained an extensive body of records documenting both policy and individual cases. So I'll be discussing these cases and the kind of records you might find in a Department of Justice enemy alien case file, as well as some of the um, other records of the Army, uh, which also document the internment of Japanese enemy aliens. Department of Justice alien enemy case files are held in a series called Class 14613, Alien Enemy Litigation Case Files and Enclosures, which are part of Record Group 60. So these case files document the cases of individual enemy aliens as they were arrested, detained, held in first temporary detention centers, and then possibly paroled or interned in the permanent internment camps. And it contains a wide variety of records documenting this process as well as documenting the hearings. The files may contain correspondence, they may contain summaries of the hearings, they may contain copies of FBI investigative records, they may contain what are called alien questionnaire forms, which are, were forms that were gathered, were used to gather personal data about the individuals. And these files can range significantly in size. Some The typical range is anywhere from 50 pages on the smaller side to closer to 275 or 300 pages for some of the larger files. And these files in this series include records related to Japanese nationals, and that includes Japanese Latin Americans who were detained in Central and South America and brought from those countries to camps in the United States. And it also includes the records of German and Italian nationals. And again, these are all records that are held by the National Archives at College Park. So here is an example of some of the records that you might find in a Department of Justice alien enemy case file. So this is a case file for an individual named Seijiro Osaki. And I wanted to include sort of two different examples of very different kinds of records that you might find in the file. The first record that you see on the left in the slide is a determination from his hearing documenting the proceedings of the hearing and also documenting the decision that was made. And so if you were to take a closer look at it, you would see that it says that it is related to the matter of Seijiro Osaki and that it's the unanimous recommendation of the board that he be paroled and that this was a decision that was reached after extensive discussion and consideration by the members of the board. And then it summarizes some information about his background and the investigation that was conducted by the FBI. So that is one example. That's sort of more of the official government records that you might find in here. The other kinds of records though that you might find are, are records of a more personal nature. So on the right, we have a letter that was submitted to the hearing board from one of Osaki's neighbors. And it says that the writer has known Seijiro Osaki for 25 years as his neighbor, and that throughout this whole time, his conduct has been one of a law-abiding citizen, that he's honest and fair in his dealings with everyone around him, 
to the best of this person's knowledge, and that he has never in his whole long acquaintance with Mr. Osaki seen anything to indicate that he was not loyal to the US government. And so you'll see copies of this kind of correspondence from friends and neighbors and other members of these people's communities writing in to testify to their loyalty and to say that you know these people were loyal residents of the United States, that they were not dangerous or disloyal. And so this is something else that you'll often find in the files. And that's a little more personal than the more official records that you'll see. So I want to discuss how you would actually locate these files. If you were looking, for example, for a file related to one of your relatives, it's, it's a multi-step process, which I've outlined here. And the very first thing you'll do is you'll want to review the digitized World War II Japanese internee cards. And these are index cards that were originally created by the Department of Justice that provide information about the proceedings, the hearings where, what camps this person was held in, and most importantly, for locating the actual case file, they provide the Department of Justice case file number, which is what you need to actually locate the case file for an individual. The process is that you would start by going to the National Archives catalog and locating a digitized index card for the individual that you are interested in. And so the easiest way to do that is just in the search box in the catalog, entering the person's name. And usually that will pull up the index card in the first few hits of the search. From there, what you want to make note of to, so that you can include it in the request that you submit to our staff is the file number. So that is in the upper right corner of the card. It will start with 146-13 usually, and it will have a, a long string of numbers. And that's the Department of Justice case file number for the file related to this individual. So if you have that, that is what we need to locate the file. So then once you've located a card, what you can do is you can send an email to our reference staff at the National Archives at College Park at archives2reference at nara.gov. And you can include the name, the file number, and just a link to the digitized card. From there, we will conduct a search to locate the Department of Justice file. And we will also search for any other files, um, for example, files held that were originally created by the Army. So we will look for other files we hold on the individual as well, not just the Department of Justice file. We will only be searching for files held at College Park, although we will try to let you know that there may be records at other facilities, but you, you would need to reach out to those other facilities to access some of the records that Katie and Ruth are going to talk about later in the presentation. Let's take a closer look at these index cards because they contain a wealth of information um, that is readily accessible online and that is available to you even before you've had a chance to either order copies of the case file or to come in to our research room to view the case file in person. Starting at the top left of the front of the card, so the image that's on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see the individual's name, any other aliases that they went by, as well as their address at the time that they were arrested. And then beneath that, you'll see what's referred to as a custody record, which is essentially a summary of the actions that took place in their case. So you'll see you know, where they were arrested and the date. You'll see where they were first transferred to after they were arrested. And you'll see sort of a whole, usually a list of multiple places that they were transferred to as they moved from temporary camps to Department of Justice or INS camp. They moved from there maybe to an army camp, maybe back to a Department of Justice camp, or maybe if they were paroled, in quotes, as Ruth said, to a war relocation authority incarceration camp, you would see that documented in that custody record part. And then you'll also see the actions taken in the case. So you'll see if somebody was released, it would say that under release, it would say if they were paroled or if they were, if the decision was to intern them. Then in the upper right hand corner on the front of the card, you'll see the Department of Justice file number. Again, the number that actually identifies the case file for this individual. 
And then you'll see a list of basically what were common actions taken in these cases, and then the dates that those actions were taken. So you'll see something about when a warrant for their arrest was issued. You'll see when the hearing notice, the date that the hearing notice was sent, the questionnaire, what the board's recommendation was. You'll see the dates of FBI reports that were compiled relating to this person, things like that. And then if on many of the cards on the back, you'll see this remarks section. And those are basically summary remarks of actions taken in the case, of documents in the case file. So usually you'll see a date, something about what kind of document this is referring to, and then what that document relates to. This does not summarize every single document in the case. What it does is provide a, a very brief summary of some of the items in the case file that whoever was creating these index cards at the time in the Department of Justice would have considered important. So it may not be what looks important to you today, but this was just what the individual creating these records in, in DOJ thought was significant to note on the index card. And so again, it's, it's just more information that is sort of very readily accessible even before you've had a chance to obtain access to the file. So the next set of records I want to talk about are records of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which are also held at the National Archives at College Park in Record Group 65. The FBI played a major role in identifying, investigating, and arresting Japanese nationals who were deemed potentially dangerous. And these actions taken by the FBI are documented in the FBI's investigative case files. So the FBI case files relating to the investigation and surveillance and arrest of Japanese nationals who were considered enemy aliens are primarily held in the series Classification 100 Domestic Security Case Files. Classification 100 case files do not just cover enemy alien investigations. Classification 100 is a set of records that was established by the FBI in the late 30s for all sorts of cases that they called domestic security cases. And so these were cases of all sorts of origins that related to individuals who were deemed subversive or dangerous by the FBI. And so at the time of the Second World War, that would have included enemy alien nationals, but it also included people who were considered radical political activists, people involved in the labor movement, in the civil rights movement, anyone basically who the FBI sort of deemed as dangerous to domestic security. Classification 100 case files were maintained from the 30s through the early 70s. And as a result, and because they cover such a, a, a large time period, they have not been fully declassified. Classification 100 case files are still classified. So if you wish to access an FBI case file related to individual of Japanese descent who was considered an enemy alien, you have to submit a FOIA request to NARA's FOIA office so that the file can be reviewed for release. If you are interested in these records and want to submit a Freedom of Information Act request, your request should include the name of the individual, the date of birth, and the FBI case file number, if you know it. And you may find that FBI case file number referenced in the Department of Justice case file. So if you have that file, you may be able to, to know the FBI file number. All FBI case files, because of the potentially sensitive information they contain, both personal information as well as information related to confidential informants and other kinds of sensitive law enforcement information have to be requested through the FOIA. With that being said, copies of some records from these FBI files are also present in the Department of Justice alien enemy case files. And because the Department of Justice case files were reviewed for release a number of years ago by the National Archives and were, for the most part, fully released, that means that those specific copies in those DOJ case files are available. So you may not be able to have as ready access to the entire FBI case file, but you will be able to access the whatever copies of FBI records made it up into the Department of Justice case file.
And so this is an example of the kind of reports you would find in an FBI file. So as I said, the records in the classification 100 FBI files in record group 65 are classified. So these documents here do not come from the FBI file itself. They are copies that were in the Department of Justice case file for Sejiro Osaki. But this is an example of what you would find if you did receive the FBI file through the FOIA or what you would find if you looked in the Department of Justice file. So this is an FBI investigative report. If you look at the top of the report in the upper left-hand corner, there's a box that says report made at, and it says Los Angeles. So this originated at the FBI's Los Angeles field office, gives you the dates of the report. It gives you the name of the agent who wrote this report right above the name of the agent. It gives you the FBI case file number. So that would be handy if you wanted to submit a FOIA request for the entire FBI case file. And then it, it, it says, you know, the name of the person being investigated. It says Seiji Osaki, and it says, you know, the, the character of the case. What, what kind of investigation is this? So internal security, alien enemy control. And then it basically provides first a synopsis of the report, and then it provides information about his arrest and detention. It provides information about why he was under investigation and surveillance by the FBI in the first place. Because as Ruth noted, not everyone who was fell under the provisions of an enemy alien was necessarily investigated or detained and interned. So it says that he appeared as a member or supporter of the Military Virtue Society of North America. So this was a group that was interested in kendo, the Japanese fencing art and that the FBI alleges also attempted to inculcate militaristic ideas in its, in its members. And so it basically outlines his involvement in this organization and also just the, the information that the FBI has gathered as they've been investigating him. And now I'd like to move on to discussing the military records we hold related to the internment of enemy aliens during World War II. Um, as Ruth mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, the enemy alien program, although it was administered by the Department of Justice, involved a number of different agencies across the federal government, including the War Department and the Army, which was a part of the War Department. And so at the National Archives at College Park, we hold a number of different military records documenting the War Department and the Army's involvement in the internment of Japanese individuals who were deemed enemy aliens. And these include both case files as well as a number of different kinds of policy records. Many of these records are held at the National Archives at College Park, Maryland in Record Group 389, which are the records of the Office of the Provost Marshal General, OPMG. The OPMG was the office within the War Department that was largely responsible for the operation of the enemy alien program within the War Department and the Army, as well as the operation of the prisoner of war program. And so among their records are records related to the imprisonment of Japanese enemy alien internees. And so these records document these individuals' internment in Army-operated camps. The case files included in the records often include personal information, um, so marital status, work history, where they lived, a personnel card, um, which might include a photo or a couple of photos, listings of the various camps, information about any legal proceedings, and the resolution of the individual's status. There is some duplication between this and the Department of Justice records. However, generally each agency's files contain also unique material that will not be found in the other file. These include individuals arrested in the United States, overseas, including in the Philippines and in Central and South America. The records are ar arranged simply by the individual's last names. We do not have a complete list of names at the National Archives, However, the records are arranged alphabetically 
and we have box lists that will tell you you know what range of the alphabet is in each box so that it is a pretty straightforward process either for you if you are coming in to do research in person or for one of our staff members to locate a file these files do tend to be substantially smaller than the department of justice files so i will often tell researchers that it's helpful to think of these as supplemental to the department of justice file that you always want to get the most complete picture you can and so these help complete that picture but generally speaking, they, they are not a substitute for the Department of Justice file. They, they are more supplemental. So this is an example of the kinds of records you might find in the OPMG case files. So this is the OPMG case file for Saiki Tsurumatsu. And this is the basic personnel record I was talking about just a minute ago. And so you can see it includes some basic personal information his name, his height, his weight, sort of identifying physical features. It includes an inventory of personal items that were taken from him when he was interned in this camp. It includes information about where he resided, what his occupation was, so he was a, a teacher, um, what languages he spoke, whether he was married or not, so it says that he was widowed. It provides information about his religion. It also includes two photos which is something that you often find in these OPMG records that often are not in the Department of Justice records are these photos. And then it includes uh, fingerprints as well. And at the very bottom of the second page of this personnel record, you will see the army camps where he was held and where he was imprisoned during the war. Finally, I'd like to discuss some additional military records we have relating to individuals who were residents of Hawaii who were interned through the enemy alien program during the war. And so we have several distinct bodies of records related to residents of Hawaii that include case files similar in form to the Department of Justice or the other Office of the Provost Marshal General case files. These records document individuals who were arrested and detained in the territory of Hawaii. And they are held in a couple of different series in case files. And so these case files may contain photographs of the internees. They may contain a variety of forms containing personal background information about the individuals. They may contain fingerprints. They may contain transcripts of alien hearing board hearings reports, uh, lists of personal items and effects, a whole variety of different kinds of records. So these are held in two different series in two different record groups at the National Archives at College Park. So first, there is an additional series of records from the Office of the Provost Marshal General in record group 389. This is a series of subject files that includes a sub-series of records related to internees who resided in Hawaii. These records are arranged by the individual's surnames and the names of the individuals are listed in the National Archives catalog. You can see if a file exists by simply conducting a search in the catalog with the person's name. The second set of records are records of the military government of Hawaii, which was responsible for administering the territory of Hawaii under martial law during World War II. And this is a series of internee case files that are held in record group 494, again at the National Archives at College Park. These case files are also arranged by the individual surnames. However, we do not have a complete list of names for this series. Instead, much like the Office of the Provost Marshal General records that I talked about earlier for residents of the continental United States, the records are arranged alphabetically. And so we can conduct a search on your behalf if we have the person's name, or you can come and locate the records when you're here at College Park. Either way, it's still a pretty straightforward process since even though we don't have a list of every name, we know which parts of the alphabet are in each of the boxes. So that concludes my discussion of the military records. And now I'd like to turn things over to Katie who will discuss the records of the INS. Thank you, David. I'll be discussing the Japanese enemy alien records held in Record Group 85, Records of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, or INS. The National Archives in Washington, D.C., also known as Archives 1, holds a tremendous amount of records related to Japanese American incarceration. We hold the majority of the textual records of the War Relocation Authority, 
the federal agency created in 1942 that oversaw the imprisonment of 110,000 Japanese Americans living on the West Coast. For those who have done research with records of incarceration, the WRA case files will be very familiar. However, Archives One also holds other Japanese and Japanese American case files in the records of the INS in Record Group 85. The INS managed a number of internment camps on behalf of the Justice Department outside of the West Coast Exclusion Zone, and some of those camps retain records with case files. A1 holds records of 12 INS camps out of the dozens of camps that existed during the course of the war. Camps did not necessarily stay open for the duration of the war. The records at A1 are considered the records of the permanent camps. Each camp had unique characteristics that make its records different than others. For example, the Seagoville, Texas incarceration camp was generally where women were incarcerated. Crystal City, Texas often held whole families and the Greenbrier Hotel at White Sulphur Spring, West Virginia held Japanese diplomats, their families and staff. Not every camp's records include internee case files. As you can see from this side, neither the White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia nor the Staunton, Virginia internment camps have case file material. Also, some case files have material from camps that don't technically have their own case file series. You'll see an example of this later in the slides. There are also records of internment in the INS's subject and policy files, a huge series that serves as the main body of records for the INS's central office from 1906 to 1957. 142 boxes of thousands of boxes of this series deal specifically with enemy aliens and contain records of deportation, repatriation, and sometimes individual case files. These case files are not in a specific order, but can be searched. They were removed from the camp file series, so they are another place to check before assuming that an internee's file was not retained. So what can an INS camp case file hold? The contents can be very similar to a WRA case file in that they contain administrative records, interview transcripts, correspondence, property records, medical records, and other things typically found in a WRA case file. However, there are some major differences. INS case files can also contain ID photographs and negatives, fingerprints, alien registration cards, certificates of identification, and lists of people being moved between camps or deported. The best way to start looking for an INS enemy alien camp case file is to search in the World War II Japanese Internee Cards Index located in the NARA catalog. Search for the person's name in the index and look at the camps listed on their card. The card may not list every site where a person was interned, but it should narrow down the number of places where a case file might be. This slide shows the internee index card for Toshiyuki Miyashita. Miyashita was transferred eight separate times to six different camps. He was transferred to the INS-run Santa Fe internment camp three separate times before he was repatriated in 1945. His case file contains materials from other places he was interned, such as Camp Livingston and Cusca internment camp, but is filed in the Santa Fe camp records. You can find in his file correspondence between camps requesting that his file be transferred to the current place he was interned. The internee cards index is the best way to search for an enemy alien camp internee, but it is not the only means of searching. If you know that your individual is likely held in an INS camp, but they do not have a card in the index, you can check to see whether they were ever sent to a WRA incarceration camp. The WRA file may mention the INS camp where the individual was previously interned. This data can be searched using the Japanese American internee data file, a database accessible from the NARA website. On this slide, you can see a screenshot of a search for Tatsuma Nishira, who was incarcerated in the, w in the WRA camps at Rohr and Tule Lake before being sent to Santa Fe to await repatriation. You can also use the Densho Names Registry to search for WRA incarceration locations. This database was created by Densho, an organization that does amazing work to preserve the history of Japanese American incarceration during World War II. Finally, if you're researching a family member, you may also have access to family history about incarceration in the form of stories, letters, and more. These are invaluable when researching where people might have been held. Even if a case file cannot be located, that does not mean that a relative was not interned by the INS or under some other jurisdiction during World War II. 
It's important for researchers to understand the difference between INS enemy alien case files and war relocation authority case files, because these are the two kinds of case files you will encounter at Archives One. As you can see, INS camp case files are arranged by file number, not by individual name. This makes the incarcerate indexes for each camp's records very important because the researcher cannot search through all of the files alphabetically. In addition, if a person considered an enemy alien was interned with additional family members, all camp case file material on that family unit would be under one file number. This all stands in contrast to WRA case files. Generally, the WRA created a file on each incarcerated person. Also, all the case files from every WRA camp were consolidated into a single giant series organized alphabetically by surname, making research comparatively much easier. This slide contains some scanned material from the INS enemy alien case file for Tatsuma Nishiro. Nishiro was initially incarcerated at the WRA-run Rohr and Tule Lake before being sent to the INS-run Santa Fe. He was thought to be a troublemaker and enemy sympathizer and was repatriated to Japan in 1945. His file contains a transcript of an interview with him where he is questioned as to his loyalties and involvement with Japanese nationalist organizations. This document illustrates the importance of looking at both the WRA and the INS case files, if a person has both, for a fuller picture of their history. Tatsuma Nishiro was incarcerated at Santa Fe internment camp when his father, incarcerated at Rohr, passed away. His family requested that he be allowed to come to the funeral. This telegram, sent by an official at Rohr, announces his father's death and asks whether the officials at Santa Fe will grant him a leave permit. His WRA case file contains the INS's letter refusing him permission to attend. INS enemy alien case files at Archives One can be full of rich family and genealogical information. These are highly under-researched files, and it's important that more people understand what they are and how they can be accessed. Please use this information to move forward with your own research and contact us, the reference team at Archives One, at the email address archives one reference at nara.gov. We look forward to assisting you. Now that Katie and David have gone over the records in their respective offices, let's shift our focus to the alien files, or more commonly known as A files. These records are part of Record Group 566, which comprises the records for the U.S. Citizenship and Naturalization Service. This is the successor agency to the INS. To put it simply, records in RG566 are just a continuation of files found in RG85. But before we dive into the A files, I want to briefly go over how to search for them and point out this year's presentation that was given by Elizabeth Burns, who went over the A files much more extensively. Elizabeth, by the way, is the subject matter expert on immigrant records. But without delving too deep into the specifics of A files, here's a quick and dirty overview of the files and how to search and request them. These files contain all kinds of immigration documents that can be a treasure trove for genealogists. A files that have been transferred to the National Archives are searchable by name and or A number in the online catalog. Once you've located someone in the catalog, please make sure to scroll all the way down to the bottom of the catalog record to identify which office to contact. A files are housed in two NAR offices, in Kansas City, where Elizabeth is located, and in San Francisco, where I am. Again, this is a short overview. For more information, please check out Elizabeth's Genie session. So what sort of any alien related documents can researchers expect to find in these files? All kinds of things, but just to reiterate some points made at the beginning of the presentation, not every person considered an enemy alien was investigated as an imminent threat to the country, which means that not all A files related to Japanese immigrants will include an extensive documentation related to their status as enemy aliens. Most times, A files pertaining to enemy aliens will include copies of reports, orders, and other administrative paperwork that can also be found in the INS, DOJ, and Army records that Katie and David went over. As I mentioned earlier, 
AFILIS are just a continuation of the work done by the INS. And since this agency coordinated with these other law enforcement offices, they will include many of the same paperwork, including some or all of the following documents listed in front of you. I do want to just point out two sets of records though. The first one is parole cards and travel documents, which can trace the movement of Japanese American enemy agents between camps, since many did not just stay in one camp for the duration of the war. This would be similar to the internee index card that David showed, David and Katie showed. Another one is the petition to reunite with families in a family internment center. These centers were not WRA camps, but were operated by the INS. The centers accommodated entire families alongside their enemy alien male family member, in contrast to the men's only facilities. Crystal City in Texas was the largest of its kind. In the sample documents for Asatoro Yamada, he applied to reunite with his family at one of these centers. He ultimately was paroled and sent to Heart Mountain to be with his family. What's great about having this duplicate paperwork is that you can then find clues leading back to the other records, including the FBI, DOJ, and other INS case files. As some of you more well-seasoned genealogists understand, sometimes you might have to work backwards to discover your family's past, and A-Files can be a great place to start this research. But there are also documents that are unique to A-Files that, when paired with the investigative or camp's records, can provide a much fuller picture of an enemy alien's wartime experience. This includes address change cards. The 1940s alien registration program required immigrants to report any change of address using a postcard form. If there are no other travel or parole documents included in the file, these cards can also show the journey an individual made from one confinement site to another. This would be similar to the internee index card from the DOJ records. Another one is the application for certificate of identification. All enemy aliens were required to register for this certificate. The application itself included fingerprints, photographs, and other information. All enemy aliens, including those not arrested, will have this document in their A file. But these forms were also used to help identify those considered particularly dangerous, such as a person's occupation or membership with organizations deemed anti-American and or pro-Japan. The initial sweeps, in part, came from the lists created from these forms. And lastly, there are also these parole conduct and activity reports. Now, it's uncertain where these whether these reports are exclusive to the A-files, but for now, let's assume they are until proven otherwise. These reports were typically generated after, and sometimes even just before, a person's release back into society. Conducted by INS parole officers, the investigations monitored the behavior of enemy aliens as they reintegrated. These reports provided detailed accounts of various aspects of a person's post-camp life, including their employment, places visited, associations, correspondence, and any expressions of loyalty or disloyalty to the US. In the sample pages you see in front of you, Yamada doesn't have any parole reports as he departed from Heart Mountain right around the time the war ended. By then, he, along with other Japanese nationals, were no longer considered enemy aliens. And so these parole reports were no longer needed. This is a good example of how not every file will contain the same set of documents depending on a person's circumstances. But don't worry, the two stories I want to highlight today do include these parole conduct reports, since these summaries can play a crucial part in reconstructing their wartime experiences, along with other documents that can be found in the A-files. The first story I'm going to share is that of Suramatsu Saiki, whose A-file really highlights the repercussions of the enemy alien registration program. 
This is the same person David covered when explaining the army camp records. But here, I just want to go a little deeper into his story. Within weeks of applying for a certificate of identification, Saiki was whisked off to Fort Lincoln, North Dakota to await his hearing and determination of status. He, along with a few hundred other Japanese American community leaders, appeared so threatening to officials that they were quickly removed from the West Coast right before the military proclaimed this area a restricted zone. So what did Saiki include on his certificate applications that might have raised such alarming concerns? He worked as a Japanese language teacher and served as the secretary for the Japanese Association of Samiseo. Apparently, these types of affiliations flagged him as a potential threat. Three months later, the summary report of his hearing noted that Saiki maintained an active role at both the school and for the Japanese Association, especially attending festivals, quote, perpetuating the empire of Japan, unquote. This hearing just bolstered the official's decision to intern him. In A files with documents on enemy aliens, Summaries of hearings are common, but details about what follows can be sparse. Sometimes, all we might find is a DOJ order or travel documents indicating the interned person's next confinement site, as seen in Yamada's case on the previous slide. But for Saiki, his conduct reports stands out for its thorough account, documenting each incarceration and transfer of which there are many, as you can see in front of you, up until his release. The best part of these reports, at least in my opinion, are the detailed narratives of his reintegration back into society. On the conduct report you see in front of you, it summarizes Saiki's whirlwind journey of transferring back and forth between all these internment camps before he finally reunited with his son in Topaz. In July 1945, a few months before the war officially ended, Saiki and his son, Hisachi, successfully petitioned and were granted resettlement in Denver, Colorado. The parole report noted Saiki's weekly reporting to the local INS parole officer, his employment at a hotel, and new sponsorship by a Dr. John Foote. What I found so fascinating about these investigative reports are the summaries of interviews with the neighbors, however brief they were. Whereas officials were using these to assess his compliance with parole terms, these neighborhood sketches also offer a glimpse of Saiki's life outside the camps and his interactions within this new community. So what kind of neighbors did Saiki have and what were their opinions of him? Well, there was Mrs. May Hannum, a housewife who lived across the street and often saw Saiki coming and going. She would, from time to time, speak with him and noted that he was law-abiding and pleasant. And then there was Mrs. Florence McFadden, a teacher and noted by the parole officer, a person of color, who lived to the left of Saiki. Though she never directly interacted with him, she too discerned his law abidingness. And lastly, there was Mrs. K. Kuratomi, a housewife who lived in the same building as Saiki. She regularly interacted with him and declared Saiki an excellent neighbor. From these little snippets, we can start imagining Saiki's life on Emerson Street, a diverse neighborhood in Denver where he exchanged nods or waves with neighbors as they passed each other, or chatted on the corner with someone he befriended when he first arrived in the area. Saiki's neighbors weren't just witnesses in his parole report, corroborating his good and harmless disposition. Instead, they emerged as integral supporting characters, actively shaping Saiki's life post-incarceration. Now, while Saiki ended up outside the exclusion zone, for those who sought to return to the West Coast before the end of the war, their parole reports show how pre-resettlement investigations were also conducted before granting readmission back to the home state. This next story comes from Sejiro Osaki, 
who was a farmer in Fresno, California at the time of his arrest. This is another Japanese American David covered earlier when he went over the DOJ and FBI records. But here again, I'm going to go just a little more into his story before getting into the documents in his A-file. As David noted, he was arrested due to his membership to the Hokubei Budokukai, or Military Virtue Society. If you remember his FBI report in the earlier slide, sorry, the one I have here is a little hidden. You will notice that the information shows how it was a standard form that was used for every member of this association. All officials had to do was insert the names. This showed how this organization was under surveillance way before the war. Now, after his arrest, he was temporarily detained at the Sharp Park Detention Center, which lasted four months before he was released and reunited with family back in Fresno. Freedom, however, was short-lived, as just a month later, they were all sent to the Gila River WRA camp. So most of Osaki's World War II story unfolded away from the enemy alien internment camps. But what's so interesting in his A file are the extensive parole reports, especially covering his return to California before the end of the war. Because he had previously been arrested as potentially dangerous, Osaki needed to ask for special permission to return to the West Coast. But before permission was granted, INS officials first went out to California to speak with Osaki's former neighbors to assess whether there was any opposition to his return. In front of you is the summary detailing the sentiments of Osaki's former neighbors concerning his return to the area, as well as their broader perspectives on Japanese Americans returning to California. His son, Frank, was already back on the farm and said that he had not encountered any discrimination. But despite not openly expressing animosity towards Osaki's son, the neighbors were far from enthusiastic about Osaki's return to Fresno. The report revealed that despite having known Osaki for years prior to the war and regarding him as, quote, a fine man, unquote, his arrest had raised suspicions among the neighbors. Speculations ranged from Osaki being a general in the Japanese army to a spy or even a fascist sympathizer. While the neighbors strenuously objected to the return of all Japanese Americans, they begrudgingly accepted the government's decision to allow their return. The sheriff, showing no objections to the Osaki family's return, confirmed the absence of any organized protests against them. Subsequent conduct reports following Osaki's resettlement into farm life reiterated similar feelings from neighbors. While acknowledging Osaki's lack of involvement in any nefarious activities, they still didn't like the fact that he came back. These reports highlight the lingering paranoia developed from the federal government's actions during the war. While Saiki's experiences in Denver might not have been as fraught with suspicion, Osaki's return to Fresno was met with palpable unease. Osaki felt this angst and deliberately distanced himself from the larger community, remaining on the farm and only venturing into town when necessary. As Saiki and Osaki settled back into broader society, their stories underscored the lingering impact of their wartime saga as enemy aliens of Japanese descent. By closely examining these accounts, we too can vividly picture their lives during these tumultuous times. So these are just two stories of post-camp life that can be found in the A-files and when combined with records from the camp files in the DC office and the law enforcement and investigative reports at the College Park office, researchers can construct a fuller picture of what these so-called dangerous enemy aliens had to endure, as well as the resilience and determination required to rebuild their lives. Ah, but there's more. 
What we cover today are just workers from our three respective offices. As mentioned at the beginning and included in your handout, there are more workers at NARA. So first up are more enemy alien workers from the INS field offices. These would include the same set of documents I just talked about in the A-files that had not been consolidated. Just a little background on A-files, INS officials often merge old records for filing efficiency. And oftentimes, you find documents from many INS offices in the same A-file. Now, the one lonely folder at San Francisco only concerns Ryoshi Johnny Yasui. This folder was simply misfiled and should have ended up in his A-file that is also at SF. But the records at Riverside are much more extensive. If you want to learn more about the Riverside records, check out Gwen Granado's excellent 2017 Genie presentation, which is now available on archives.gov. The last set of records I want to mention are from the State Department. These records relate to the internment of Japanese diplomats and their families, as well as some of the administrative aspects of detaining Japanese Latin Americans. They also cover the negotiation of civilian internee exchanges. That's the photo you see in front of you. If you have family members who were part of this group or just have any historical research interests on this aspect of the enemy alien program, please contact the textual reference branch at College Park. Thank you so much for attending today's session on World War II enemy aliens records related to Japanese Americans. My colleagues and I are happy to take any questions you may have now. If you require further assistance, you can also reach out to any of our offices using the contact information in front of you. We also encourage you to post questions and participate in discussions online at History Hub, which is NARA's crowdsourced history research platform. People can get answers from multiple sources, including NARA staff, other agencies, and a community of citizen experts. Lastly, just like Katie mentioned earlier, we would also highly recommend checking out Densho, which is a nonprofit organization that maintains a digital repository of oral histories and other primary source materials related to Japanese Americans, much of which concerns World War II incarceration. They also have a ton of educational materials and resources for genealogists. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you again for watching. This ends the lecture portion of the broadcast, but we will continue to take your questions about today's topic in the chat. If we do not get to your question, please send us an email at inquire at nara.gov. Note that the videos and handouts will remain available on this YouTube page and our website. We plan future programs based on your feedback. Would you please take a minute to complete our short online evaluation form? At this time, I'd like to thank the Genealogy Series team who contributed to the success of this program. We are grateful for your work. If you enjoyed this video, check out our Know Your Records program. We have over 100 educational videos on how to conduct research at the National Archives. Although this concludes the video portion of the broadcast, we will continue to take your questions in the chat for another 10 minutes. Please stay if you have questions. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation.
Hello, I'm Chris Naylor, Executive for Research Services, and I want to thank you for joining us for the National Archives and Records Administration's 2024 Genealogy Series. I hope you enjoyed hearing from National Archives experts across the United States during this year's program. Our presenters shared research tools and tips for exploring your family history. Their presentations explained how to use a wide array of records from the National Archives holdings and featured passport applications, Native American Army Scouts, captured German records related to American POWs during World War II, A-files for immigrants to the United States, and World War II enemy alien records related to Japanese Americans. Don't worry if you missed a premiere. All session recordings and handouts are available on our Genealogy Series webpage. As we close out this year's program, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who made the 2024 Genealogy Series possible, those who led sessions and those behind the scenes. Thank you for your participation in the 2024 Genealogy Series and your continued interest in the records maintained at the National Archives. We look forward to seeing you next time.